Alright, we are here with Styx Hex and Hammer 666. Uh, he's probably one of the most prolific YouTubers around. And, I mean, the guy goes off scripts and <laughs> he's, he's pretty amazing, actually. How are you? I'm good. Yourself? I'm doing great. Uh, thanks for doing this, by the way. Oh, it's uh, a pleasure. Yeah, so let's just jump right into it. Uh, I saw on Twitter, uh, I think it was last week or the week before, you were going off on Senator John McCain quite a bit. Uh, what what exactly does he represent? He represents the old establishment Republicans that they don't really know how to do strategy. They don't know how to wage a campaign. It's sort of like the Democrats. They need a lot of money from a handful of corporations and banks. They think that wins them the election. And back during the past era with the cable news media, they would have been right. Like that was a wise thing to do because you have to be able to buy the TV ads. Now, though, you can reach more people online, which means that one image goes viral, one video clip, and you get all sorts of free advertisements you don't even have to pay for. I think Trump realized this. Rand, actually, I think kind of was the first to embrace this, but he gets shafted because he wasn't willing to go out on a limb and start insulting people. Uh, I liked him first and foremost, actually, among the Republicans that were running in the last election in the primaries. Uh, but he does a good job. Trump does a good job. John McCain, meanwhile, doesn't really do a good job. He comes out and complains about people online making fun of him. It's like nothing is sacred anymore. You've got to be, you know, at some point, these people have to get used to that. Yeah, and, okay, so I, I still see a, a lot of resistance with the establishment GOP against Trump and his new brand, or at least the new brand he brings to politics. Uh, on the conservative end, do you, do you think they'll ever give him any any room for for pushing back, or is this going to be the way things are throughout his term? They, they might, might if the Republicans, Republicans do well in the midterms, because then they won't be able to. Right now, it seems like the excuse they're generally using is, "Oh, we're afraid Trump's going to collapse the party by being crazy." But if it becomes clear that Trump hasn't collapsed the party, that line no longer works. I think, though, they're more worried about him succeeding, though, in essence, than even failing. Because of the way he does business and, and what his campaign style represents and the things that he's been pushing, you look at the, uh, the Raise Act of today, a lot of Republicans in like the border states especially They've got ties to corporations that use illegal immigrants for labor. They exploit them, they work them to death, they dump them out in the desert somewhere. Trump is clearly opposed to this. And so I don't think they like that very much. They don't really have a reason to touch the issue. They had to, it took them months to come around even really to the idea of, of funding the basics of the border wall. Um, that, would, that was planned months and months before. It was one of the main selling points of Trump's campaign. And they, they said, well, no, no, we'll think about this later. We'll think about tax reform later too. We're gonna focus on healthcare, which is all well and good. But then when push comes to shove, all the same people that were saying, uh, uh, where we wanna get rid of Obamacare, something needs to be done. All of a sudden they start voting against their own proposals. And the first two, the first two deserve to be voted against. The people supporting it are the same ones that oppose the new repeal guidelines that are being talked about now. That's more on the sort of Trump, I think, and kind of Rand side of things, or Justin Amash, somebody who actually has common sense. So why why do you think there is this, uh, I guess, backhand to the GOP base uh, when it comes to actual policy changes? Uh, because, uh, because the, the old guard, guard Republicans, Republicans are basically just Democrats, Democrats and the old guard, guard Democrats, Democrats are basically the same as Republicans. They don't really stand for anything. anything. Both, Both sides, sides just sort of stand for the status quo to the point people, I think, started to notice, especially online, with the really, really hyperpartisan discourse. It is like a pitchfork wielding mob. You, you have to have seen it. Like anybody who's gone on the internet seen it. What happened is they had to use a handful of wedge issues that didn't really mean anything to differentiate themselves because the Republicans spent the last 20 years talking about how they're fiscally conservative. And their idea of fiscal conservative is we're gonna lower taxes by one measly percent. It's still gonna be the highest in the developed world overall, you know, without the loopholes that favor corporations. And we're still gonna give them welfare, uh, but we're conservative, just trust us. The Democrats, meanwhile, they're not really far out there and any much further left than the Republicans are on a fiscal issue. They're like, well, we're gonna raise taxes by half a percent. It'll be wonderful. Look at all the welfare we can give to 
corporations, again, not, not to people who actually would use that to have a decent living standard, but a bunch of multinational firms. Uh, guns, great example. The Republicans come out and they say, we're pro-gun. Trump is more pro-gun than almost any other Republican I can think of, other than, again, those that lean towards libertarianism and want to have a total hands-off situation uh, approach to it. Now, because he's not talking about you no know, additional gun control, he's saying get rid of existing gun control. When's the last time a Republican talked about that? It was basically absent in the 90s. They stood against the assault rifle ban, uh, and then they sort of, you know, they failed and didn't want to talk about it. That runs out on its own. Nobody ever did anything to actively remove it. They simply wanted it to lapse. And and so I, I hear this this uh, line a lot from from Democrats and progressives alike, where they they say, oh well, our our taxes on the richest are so low now in comparison to. 50s when our economic growth was the, the largest. Uh, yeah, and what do you have to say to that? They're, they're right, right and wrong. Uh, they're right in the sense that the the rich, when you're talking about multinational firms, aren't pulling their weight. But they're wrong in the sense that the tax rate itself is not responsible for that. It's sky high. The problem is that a handful of extre you know, the extremely wealthy, not the one percenters, the one one hundred, the one percenters can hire an army of lawyers and accountants that in turn pay, you know, that higher tax rate, funnily enough, to shelter themselves. So those people pay little to nothing, and that's where a huge proportion of the economy is. Uh, what, uh, what I've said now, now for some time is what they should do is just lower, lower the actual tax rate drastically. I mean, dra I don't mean even what Trump's proposing. Oh yeah, two or three percent will take off. I'm talking slash it by more than half and close every loophole. That means that the mom and pop bookstore right now, they you know the, the dude who runs it, pays 35, 40, 45 percent of his income all told with taxes and fees. Shouldn't be paying that much. Should there should be like a twenty percent hard cap on what anybody should pay in the country, no matter how much wealth they generate. The corporation that right now pays one percent, or it pays zero, or even gets money back, pays the same twenty percent. You're getting a lot more money down the road. You can pay all these social programs the Democrats want. Those that actually should be retained because they do something good could be easily paid for without any sort of deficit whatsoever. We'd run a surplus. We could pay for military spending with or without repealing no bid contracts. We could pay for everything under the sun. It would be so much more efficient. And then smaller upstart groups would be, they would no longer be fighting with one arm tied behind their back. Right now, an entrepreneur has a good idea and they get screwed by taxes. A corporation with some shitty idea pays almost nothing, promulgates that bad idea and strangulates us further. So uh, going off of that, um, we see that somebody else who, who also benefits from, I guess, these these loopholes and subsidies are congressmen. And Trump oh, look, uh -huh. is looking to attack their health care subsidies. Uh, is this a step in the right direction to cut away at Obamacare or are we stuck with it? It's, it's absolutely, absolutely a good idea. And the same people that'll call him out for it now supported it years ago. They supported the idea. I remember seeing people who were diehard partisan Democrats saying the same thing when the Obamacare stuff first started happening. Oh, well, you know, they would fix the problems that do exist. And, you know, when they were honest enough to admit there were problems with Obamacare, some of them are. Those that were, they'd say, well, we could fix this if we just made Congress beholden to the same health care plans. Then there wouldn't be a problem. They would have a reason to fix it because, you know, they and their staffers and all of their employees and, and stuff. Uh, that right now they get deferential treatment, they wouldn't get it anymore. I think uh, Congress should be tied to the same laws that they make insofar as it's possible to do so, whenever possible, so that they have some skin in the game uh, regarding what they're actually talking about. Because if they, if they knew that they weren't gonna get special congressional health care plans, they would have had a reason to slow down the process of Obamacare being passed in the first place and said, well, maybe we should have time to read it because it's going to affect us, it's going to affect our staff. I think that would have been the right thing to do. Now, it's too late for that, but certainly uh, Trump going after them now is at least a step in the right direction, yes. So do you think this can actually spark like a, a grassroots movement or is there any taking the party back? No, the, the grassroots movement in the Republican Party has already begun. Uh, Trump is a symptom of that, Rand Paul was too. 
uh, in all honesty, you can say Ben Carson was kind of part of that. He he rose to the top briefly uh, as well and had quite a bit of support. It's about it's one part personality and another part is the person meme worthy at this point. And Clinton never realized this. She tried to be very professional and say, well, Trump is being mean or Trump is being unprofessional. Nobody cared if he was being unprofessional because the concept of what that consists of is so malleable. Uh, right now we're under a, a huge cultural shift in the way in which people perceive of things. I see it as one part increasing desire for liberty while at the same time we have this weird and confusing counter argument to that that's like more pro censorship and I guess we have to wait and see who wins out. Uh, it takes more than the, the right wing though to make, to make that, that happen. happen. That's, That's why, why these progressive voices within the Democratic Party. Party. We, we can, can think that they're crazy on fiscal issues, but on social issues, they do fundamentally, they have the right idea. They're trying to ignore banks and corporations and get people in there that at least seem to care about the average person. They can't do that while being pro-censorship because then they get strangulated too in any response that they make on political issues. So. I get the the memeing in into the presidency was was a big <laughs> thing in every YouTube comment section you could think of. Um, now going off of that, do you think Kid Rock will be memed into uh, Congress? If he, he runs seriously, seriously, I think he'll win. Really? And what ramifications do you think that'll have? It, it opens, opens up, up for uh, other, you know, celebrities or, or personas, whether it's an internet only presence or they're like independently wealthy to make runs too. Trump sort of cracked the door open. It was already kind of cracked open for him because of the social change we're seeing in the country away from really respecting career politicians, distrust in the media is part of this. Uh, that also has a feedback loop into the online world because you know, the alt media is growing. Uh, the uh, entertainment industry being ignored by people, uh, uh, politicians in general, the, the squeaky clean sort of family friendly business suit wearing idea of the politician of the 1990s has obviously begun to, to erode uh, greatly. So that's already gone. It's basically they're beating a dead horse if they put another Hillary Clinton forth against Trump in 2020 if he runs and he, he says he will. Even in the midterms though, it could get dicey. Uh, specifically because of people like Kid Rock. If he gets serious about it, there may be a, a slew of other individuals who do the same on both the right and the left. And their fans are very likely, if they're younger, to pressure those on the right to be actually conservative or even libertarian uh, or, or all right or whatever it happens to be. Those on the left will pressure the candidates that they favor as sort of you know celebrity idols or whatever into be. They're not going to want neoliberals. That's boring. They're going to want people to be progressive or like a throwback to the JFK era when the Democratic Party actually had some <laughs> some intellectual standards. Let's say. Yeah, I think that's kind of strange how um, the tables have really turned for the longest time. It was oh, climate change deniers don't understand science, and then it came to the gender dysphoria thing and it was like, well, you guys are denying all of this science. Yeah. Um, <laughs> how do you see that battle going with, the, I guess, the battle for science? I think people are going to get tired of being censored altogether and they're going to get tired of debating one another constantly and being misused by corporations and politicians. Uh, so it might calm down or it might become more of a pitchfork wielding mob than it even is, but it'll be more and more fringe. Because if the Democrats and Republicans, people years ago were talking about how the two parties were drifting apart and becoming more extreme. They weren't, they were converging. They were just delving into more and more extreme wedge issues because they were converging on everything else. So if you've got two groups of people that are exactly the same, then they have to get more extreme to differentiate themselves on issues that they don't even really care about, like gay marriage, abortion, whatever it happens to be. They don't care about these things. All of these, but none of these politicians are ever going to seriously do anything about these issues that they actually diverge on. They don't care. What you're seeing though is that culture is sort of diverging uh, away. And it's not bipolar either. There are multiple other sort of competing groups. There's sort of the general pro liberty feeling, there's the racialist sentiment, especially on the right. There's the progressive movement. There's the, the sort of old guard neoliberals and neocons in the center. And, and there are other groups too. There are people now that are openly avowing communism or, or they call themselves real Nazis or something like that. 
And that's something that you didn't really see in American discourse, say, in the 90s or something like that. So with the, I guess, the bravery of, of communists these days, uh, we see a perfect example of their, their ideology failing, or at least its, its retarded cousin, uh, socialism in Venezuela. And it looks like it's about to go a totalitarian regime uh, for a few years or the foreseeable future. Uh, and socialists like Cenk Uygur and Anna Kasparian are, are blaming outside forces, they're blaming corruption, and they're blaming uh, other externalities for uh, their hyperinflation and their failing policies. Now, is, is this narrative of excuses for socialism going to be the prevailing one in, in the media, or is there going to be any logic used uh, at this point? Yeah. yeah. In, in the, the old, old guard, guard media, it'll, it'll prevail, prevail, but people, people are, aren't, aren't paying, paying attention, attention to the old guard, guard media, so, so it doesn't really matter. matter. Um, uh, socialism, socialism is responsible for Venezuela's, Venezuela's problems. problems. And, and I think, I think if you pay attention to online discourse, discourse, even in places that are like leftist, leftist safe spaces, spaces, you see a lot of dissent on the issue because they're like, well, yeah, yeah, okay, maybe socialism's, socialism's okay, okay, but Maduro's, Maduro's just crazy, and you're trying, trying to apologize for him. They're, they're actually, actually kind of shooting themselves in the feet by trying to defend his regime. And, and what Jank and these others don't want, want people to realize is that the, the embargo and sanction sort of stuff that they blame for the problem were already in place many years ago in some form and variant. And it has nothing to do with their the economy didn't suddenly collapse because a sanction was put on their country. The sanctions were there, and then it started collapsing simply because of oil prices. But anyone who spends five minutes researching the composition of the Venezuelan economy is going to see that that's the case. So, I mean, it's in, it's impossible for them to defend the Maduro regime. But it's already been totalitarian anyway. It was under Chavez. Maduro is not even the one technically responsible. It was Hugo Chavez who put the whole policy into place uh, and refused to diversify the economy so he could give people microwaves. Maduro, Maduro just continued Chavez's policies. Uh, ult ultimately, the blame lies only on him for being hyper-violent. Yeah, and I, I guess um, the kidnapping of the opposition in uh, the past couple days, uh, how that leaked out, it reminds me a lot of uh, Fujimori when he had his guy go in and try to kill a politician that was running against him, and then... <laughs> He goes, oh, uh, I didn't know about that. And I, I'm wondering what Maduro's, um, his excuse is going to be, you know, oh, it was radicals or something like that. Um, yeah, yeah, probably. Well, at some point, somebody will probably end up having to assassinate him to get him out of there anyway. Because it's clear uh, Venezuela is not going to undergo a coup because of just violence and scarcity, because they've had that for now several years. It hasn't happened. Uh, the, the problem, problem can get, get worse and worse, but it's like boiling the frog. The frog doesn't even know it's being cooked. So the people have grown desensitized, I think, to some of the worst aspects of socialism there. Ultimately, some, some militant group or some disgruntled military general is likely to kill off Maduro and seize power. Uh, that comes with its own problems. It might not be a capitalistic coup. It might be a different group of socialists that's even worse. Well, I guess we have to wait and see, actually, sort of who preempts who in getting rid of him. Sort of a Pol Pot situation, I guess, where it was one <laughs> one communist after another after another, and then let's make the Muslims eat pork. Um, <laughs> so, I'm sorry about that. Ben Shapiro recently debated Cenk Uygur on possibly one of the most celebrated um, debates I've ever seen. And I think... What happened was what most people were expecting to happen, but uh, what good does the debate actually do? Uh, I mean, I've, I've seen comments about Shapiro manipulating facts and a bunch of ad hominem attacks on him, and so on a large scale, do, do they really matter? No, no debates, debates don't, don't do anything. Uh, there's a reason why I avoid bothering to debate. I can disagree with someone, leave a sarcastic comment, but I don't make debate videos, and here's why. Anybody who is strongly political probably went there or, or tuned in already supporting Jank or Shapiro. The 99.9% .9 of them left without their opinion having changed at all because they programmed themselves to see even a reasonable argument from the person they happen to like less will be cast aside as, oh yeah, but this is, this is just an evil right-wing bigot or this is just a, a stupid left-wing hack. So it doesn't change anybody's opinion. No, no fence sitter who has 
sort of lukewarm political opinions is even going to tune into that kind of debate. Because why would they care about it? I mean, uh, it's just somebody who's, you know, Bernie Sanders style left slash kind of a neoliberal sellout, sometimes kind of weird, versus Shapiro, who's sort of the missing link between libertarianism and neoconservatism. Nobody's going to tune into it as if they don't have strong political opinions to begin with. I don't think it changed a single person's opinion. Yeah, and I, I think it was very strange to see um, <laughs> Chang actually kind of lose his composure. Uh, I remember that's not usual. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, he imploded, but not to the degree that I thought he would. Uh, I remember watching the Ann Coulter debate he had last year, and how he was kind of using the crowd to bully her into corners, and then he wasn't able to do that this time. And it, <laughs> I mean, just to see his face when his jokes failed. It was, it was kind of marvelous. Yeah, yeah it kind of like when Crowder was uh, was imitating Jenk there at the panel, I think earlier this year, and showed up, you know, be, being off the wall, and his jokes fell flat too. But I mean, that was a room of 50 people, so nobody yeah. cared. Yeah, he, he really should have posted or something, just risked it, because it was, it was uncomfortable to watch, just like this dead room, and he's, he's doing his bit. Um, so... <laughs> See, yeah, I, 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 in, all in all honesty, honesty I didn't even tune into the Zhang Shapiro debate because my mind wouldn't be changed either. I don't yeah, like Zhang. Uh, I, I consider him a corporate sellout. I'm not a big Shapiro fan. I differentiate myself from some of his views. He's more tolerable than Zhang, but I mean, I'm not like some Shapiro super fan. So I'm just not interested in really reviewing the content because it's so ineffectual. It's yeah. interesting, but it doesn't change anybody's mind, I think. Yeah, well, I mean, it debilitated into, um, you know, the Democrats of the real races and, and <laughs> just not, like nothing of use, I think. Uh, Republicans are the, are the real welfare supporters because of corporations, you know, that stuff. Yeah. So <laughs> we have circuses like this with the new media. We have, you know, Alex Jones going on to chank set and just messing with them, <laughs> just meltdowns like this. Um so how long do you think it'll be before this this new and vibrant media takes over the old one? It already has. Uh, very few people at this point trust cable news. Newsprint is dying. I see apologism for cable news all the time from like Salon and some of these groups because you, you got to pay attention to these rags, you know, to know their weird opinions so you can criticize them. Yeah. Uh, but they're constantly trying to lay the groundwork for propping them up, but it's not going to work. Like, who still buys a newspaper? It's like uh, that story about Bernie Sanders there stealing his neighbor's newspaper, which I'm 90% sure that was meant to be satire and just didn't list itself as it. So I'm not sure how seriously I take it. Somebody made a comment there, and I thought this was one of the funniest things I ever read, that he was he was using it to, uh, to bed down his exotic parrot collection or something. Because it, 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 they were talking about, what was it? What was it uh, uh, Newsweek or something like that. Like it's old guard media. Nobody pays attention to it. They read the paper for the cartoons. Maybe they watch cable in the background. It's like they're banging or or doing something else. They just got the TV on. They're not paying attention to it. Yeah, and I, I think it's what the new media really has over the old is the interaction. Um, oh, yeah. I mean, any any CNN. Um, video that you can you can find there's just so little interaction whatsoever versus you know somebody with 20,000 subscribers that just started <laughs> it's heavily engaged um, yeah uh, uh, yeah, yeah the the core, core fan base is a lot larger because uh, there's an encouragement to interact I mean it's it's important for people to interact if you want your content spread but CNN's like oh we're just putting this on here for the people that already like our news service which is like 10 people at this point so and then comments disabled. <laughs> and yeah, they well, they don't have them disabled on YouTube, but if you look at their ratings, you see what people really think of them, I think. <laughs> uh, so with the, the increasingly authoritarian uh, social <laughs> media uh, policies, uh, how, how do you think that's actually going to affect the way that information is disseminated in the future? Okay. Uh, a, movement a movement away from, from singular, singular hegemonic large sites, sites and towards smaller sites, sites that are sort of uh, syndicate in nature. Uh, uh, that, that is like, like crowdfunding, crowdfunding, like with pa uh, Patreon, if, if, if it begins, begins to collapse. collapse. Now, they're trying to address the issue. 
I, I replied to it and said, I do appreciate that they're at least trying to address it. I have my reservations about continuing to use it at all. But if they were to suddenly like totally collapse, just you know, go out of business entirely, I think what you would see is multiple sites essentially with the same model, but they would brand themselves as we're, we're a site for leftists to fund. This is a site for, for people who are conservative or libertarian to fund. This is a site that simply wants anyone to fund, but we're explicitly pro-free speech uh, and we have no censorship whatsoever and constantly oppose it, which is a de facto, like a constitutionalist approach or something. I think that these larger sites are going to crack apart and the sort of infighting you get on site eventually will get so dirty that it will cause schismatic movements and people will migrate back to what will be at first echo chambers and then the process starts all over again. We've already seen this, by the way, people don't want to talk about this. Uh, you have Wikipedia. Wikipedia is perceived by both the left and right as being <laughs> essentially politicized in nature. So Conservapedia exists and then Rational Wiki exists. And so you've got this sort of bipolar approach. Anyone with strong political opinions is more likely to use one of those sites and ignore now Wikipedia entirely. I was not aware of that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you've, you've got, got a dedicated a sort of more or less, they self-proclaim it. Uh, rational Wiki proclaims itself to be the, the rational slash more left-leaning version of Wikipedia in response to Conservapedia, which billed itself as where the right-wing Wikipedia. And that happened, that was quite some time ago. That's not even recent. So it's already, it's been an ongoing process. It starts with that more academic informational side. It's moving into entertainment and analysis, I think now. It's, it's like, like a cancer. cancer. It's spreading it's around, around the internet. internet. And, and thankfully, and thankfully it's, it's not a fatal cancer. cancer. It's something, something that self limits. And how does uh, net neutrality play into all of this? Because I, I've been hearing arguments from both sides, and I'm just, I'm not sure what to think at this point. I, I, I feel, feel the same, same way you do. You That's it's such, such a weird, complex, complex issue that I'm like, like <laughs> does it even really matter to me whether it exists or not? In a perfect world, the ISPs would never throttle anything because people would get angry if they did. The problem is in some areas, not all, and I think in, in areas where there's no monopoly, I don't think it would ever become a problem. But I li like I live in Vermont, so we've got one service provider, we've got Comcast. Therefore, if Comcast starts throttling access to some smaller sites or something so that it affects 10 people in the whole state, there's not going to be a lot of backlash there. They might end up doing something like that. Whereas at the same time, if you do have net neutrality, it sort of asserts FCC and government power over the internet in a way. And I'm not sure I'm comfortable with that either because then they can potentially expand upon that at a later date. Even if net neutrality itself is just a very stripped down idea of having a fair and open internet, it could be expanded upon because it gives them that sort of legal precedent to do so. I prefer that we institute a constitutional amendment defining communications technologies, things like the internet is explicitly falling under the First Amendment and an expansion of the First Amendment to constrain corporations that are engaging in disseminating information uh, on that scale. That is, if you, if you wanna do business in the US, you're going to have to abide by the rudiments of the First Amendment as well, and the Fourth Amendment, because otherwise you're not going to be able to do business. Because quite clearly, you are a def you may not legally be a full public service; it's still a private company, uh, but in a sense, you are actually a public service. It has become so gargantuan; it requires some degree of protection for users because it now makes up a significant proportion of the entire economy and involves virtually every human being in the world, actually, you know, in, the, in any part of the world that's semi-developed now even, uh, using these services. So I'm wondering if there's a way that they could, they could do, um, they could create monopolies and oligarchies in, a, I guess, a less nefarious fashion where, you know, you have these limited data plans on, on most people's smartphones and they say, oh, well, if you use this streaming service, you know, you get unlimited data. So you essentially cripple the rest of the competition because they don't have that unless, you know, you already have unlimited data or you already have like a really good Wi-Fi connection or something. Um, do, yeah. do you think that could play a part in it or is this like a, a conspiracy theory? 
I'm not sure. I, I think the best thing to do is just make the internet as free market and Wild West style as possible, because then if you get corruption, typically people get mad. The, the first thing is they try to petition that company. Sometimes it works. We've seen this even on YouTube. People who are despondent about the new TOS changes don't realize we not even a few months ago, their restricted mode that they were going to make site wide for every non signed in user was was regressed back to what it had been because of outcry. They said, okay, we're just gonna have it something you can opt into if you run a school or a library or something. It is possible to get these tech firms to worry about their income and their user base enough to hold off usually the worst of censorship and things like that. If it doesn't, alternatives can be created, including by other large companies. They're constantly at each other's throats. Some people have said, oh, well, Amazon and YouTube and stuff should be gone after with monopoly laws. They're not monopolies. One misstep in one of their major competitors can pour a half billion dollars into creating a ripoff of their site, and they know it, and it's happened before. Uh, it's it's entirely possible for them to do this if one of these other sites stops being hegemonic because it's uh, pissed off its competitors. MySpace was essentially the hegemon of social media early on. Look what happened to them. So yeah, we have hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars. This is in the earlier internet when that was, was a huge amount of money that you don't even have most of the major tech firms that exist any uh, right now. And then they redesign their site in a way that's not even really was it that bad, all things considered, they completely collapsed themselves. Nobody uses their service anymore. Yeah, and I, I think uh, most people completely forgot about MySpace entirely because no. you know, yeah, <laughs> Some I remember- probably don't even realize it existed. <laughs> and that it's still there, just somewhere in the ether. Um, so I know this is, is pretty old news and you, you've since declared yourself um, a pagan or, or an occultist, I think. Um, but I saw your hashtag the other day about, uh, I think it was Satan's like pillars of uh, faith or something. And I'm a novice here, obviously. And my only real reference for Satan is uh, Paradise Lost by John Milton. Um, and I understood him as, as kind of a libertarian. Is, is that yeah. something to do with what drew you in originally? Yeah, yeah, well, not with Satanism. Uh, that, that's different from the archetype of Satan. I don't believe in a devil. You know, For anyone out there who's worried, oh, Antichrist or something, uh, not really. I don't really care if somebody practices Christianity or any other religion. Just in full disclosure here, I got past sort of most of the anti-spiritual stuff. Now I just criticize organized religion because they're operated like corporations. For me, though, the, the symbol of Satan, which appears very little actually in the Bible and is primarily written about in secondhand accounts from elsewhere, including the modern period, Satan's nothing more than a liberator. Sort, sort of, you know, is getting abused, stands against the abuse, does get screwed in the process, but still stands against it. And it's divorced of like the moral connotation beyond being pro-freedom. Uh, I, th I think that a lot of those that were involved with making the United States in the first place an actual sovereign entity, probably admired Satan more than they admired Jesus Christ. I, th I think they. I think that they weren't like some people are like, oh, because they're part of a Masonic devil worshiping community. No, they were deists. Uh, they saw the traditional dogmatic, very religious and uh, deity of the Christians as evil, because he was abusive. He was constantly purging people and judging them, sending them to hell forever and stuff like that. Satan is sort of an afterthought. Some of the references to Satan that have been concocted in modern language don't even refer to Satan. The, the word Lucifer isn't even a proper noun. I saw footage once of a Mason that had been uploaded to YouTube and it was being used by some new age Christian as evidence that they worship the devil where he's like, oh yeah, I love Lucifer, I love Lucifer. But if you look, it's just a mistranslation of the Greek phosphoros. He was talking about Jesus himself. He wasn't talking about Satan. Uh, so a lot of religious people, when I bring up any of these topics, they don't even really know what I'm talking about. And they assume that I'm worshiping the devil, that I don't even believe in. I just say I have an academic interest in occult literature. I, pr I believe in magic and spirituality. I just, I don't care about the theism issue. I'm antagonistic towards religion in general because I see it as a bad thing for the world. It's a form of tyrannical control. I think um, something that I that I always had against uh, anti-theists 
is um, they they were always so hell bent on on just criticizing everybody else's religion, and it was it was kind of failing to to see that that was also their religion. You know, where they're like their god is gonna always criticize them, and this person's criticizing them for being criticized. Yeah. And um, I, I guess most younger atheists grow out of it around high school. I, I know that's <laughs> what I did. I, I stopped being so antagonistic. I was like, all right. Um, but I, yeah, I will, you stop, you stop you caring know, after a while. I became apathistic and don't even talk about it. Because it's like, you're going to claim their, this person's going to claim that their God is real. Okay. That person's claiming a different God is real. Okay. This person's claiming there's no God at all. Okay. None of them can prove it to me. None of them are ever going to convince me that they've got an obje uh, an objective argument. Why would I care? Well, yeah. Well, I do love the uh, the Muslims when they say, you know, Allah is the same God all around. It's like, no, Allah makes your asshole go away when you go to heaven, and he gives you a bunch. <laughs> yeah, of there's a little bit of a cultural difference. Uh, one thing that's funny is that a lot of those very antagonistic. Uh, individuals who, like maybe 10 years ago, I would have recognized as, at the time, uh, fellow anti-religious individuals. A lot of them now are not so anti-religious. They're actually, they're like, oh, the Pope's a wonderful dude. He doesn't want to build walls. Yeah, you, London has a, a religiously Islamic mayor that's so progressive and tolerant. And if it were a Christian mayor, they'd have a problem with it. Oh, he's, he said he believes in Jesus. Church and state should be separate. They do that over here too. It's like if, yeah, if the president comes out and says, oh, Islam is wonderful, Islam is, is peaceful, and we must have more Allah stuff, nobody has a problem with it. But if they say the same about Jesus, all of a sudden, oh, they get up in arms. They're like, the Ten Commandments monument doesn't belong here. Let's put a mosque up next door instead. And they have no problem with that. It's like, it's like they have a certain list. They have a hierarchy. I think some of these people just have really hierarchical minds. They, they want, want to arrange, arrange things into categories, into levels of, of how, how much they, they like them. them. And, and so, so at the top, top maybe they put like hardline atheism, atheism and then they put like spiritual deism and then Islam and then, Islam, and then, then all the rest, rest according to the propaganda that they've been fed about these movements. They don't even realize half of this comes from propaganda that was around 10 years ago. I, I think a lot of it is that they're, they, they see themselves as being anti-establishment. And so they yeah. see Christianity being establishment, and they see uh, white people as being establishment. So, I mean, you put a brown person who believes in something different, and they see that as anti-establishment. So I guess they're for it that way. Um, yeah. Yeah. Remember, Remember, white, white people, people are evil, people but we shouldn't see, see race, race is basically what, what they're, they're, they're saying, saying over and over. It's, what are you talking about? about? Oh, kind of mutually exclusive. exclusive. White people are evil, and they're terrible at everything, but Scandinavia looks awesome. So, yeah, yeah the Scandinavians are so wise, and the Germans too now with Merkel. They're wise and they're benevolent, they're perfect. If you question them, there's something wrong with you, but they're all evil. <laughs> they're all suffering eternally for being bigots. <laughs> well, um, if you don't mind, I'd like to get to the uh, a couple of the questions that I had for you uh, from the, the chapter. And right. one, of, one of them is... The other leather jacket wearing YouTuber, Razor Fist, uh, what are your thoughts on him? I like, I like his, his content. content. Uh, I support him. I, th I think he's well spoken, number one. Uh, I haven't. I don't really watch the, the gaming and movie videos so much because, you know, I, I'm not a huge gamer. I have my own really weird, sort of eclectic taste in movies. I like some of the old classics and stuff. I think I'd probably sync up with him on horror movies, though. Uh, uh, but generally, he, he stands against uh, oppression of speech and things of that nature without being so far out there. Some people, I agree with them on that, but then they have all these really, really weird out there, like they're the total racialists uh, or, or even they're far left in some cases, like a Bernie bro who's like, yeah, censorship is bad. Socialism, though, somehow is a good thing. And I just can't sing, sort of sync up with them. So I like Razor Fist content. Nice. Uh, I'm sure you'll be happy to hear that. Um, so the next one is, uh, what is your view on whether or not postmodernism was inevitable thanks to modernism rejecting God? Uh, in, in the artistic sense or in general? I, I think he's asking in the philosophical sense. Uh, he didn't really elaborate. Yeah. yeah, I'm sorry. About uh, that. Well, well, things, things to, uh, if this person's ever read uh, Plato's Republic, 
Yes. It's not just it's not just politics that move in a cycle. Uh, you get this from time to time. We've gotten it before. We had it in the interwar period. We're talking post World War One within Europe. Uh, you you get sort of what could be considered similar to the modern philosophy and society and, and artistic movements twain with that. What you have now is a resurgence of philosophies that are opposed to that. But I'd say the abandonment of God is is a symptom rather than a cause. Uh, so often people, they look at one very limited aspect of human existence and they declare it a, a prevailing problem, they declare it a disease. Oftentimes though, the reason they can never cure it is because it's just a symptom, they're trying to uh, treat symptomatically. And the rejection of God sort of goes, I think, hand in hand with the world is increasing in population density. More and more people are, are getting senescent very early on. They're stagnant. They don't, they don't go out much, essentially. They're in some clerical job. The economies of the world have begun to falter. It's going to become an enormous problem over the next few decades. Uh, we're approaching the edge of a behavioral sink. Uh, at least in my opinion. And I think that's going to collapse swaths of the world's population. Uh, there's more and more social alienation going on. There's both warmongering and pacifism constantly vying and trying to choke each other out and they can never truly ever permanently win. Uh, the rejection of God, I think, is just a symptom uh, rather than the cause of postmodernism, which I generally, I reject most postmodern elements uh, myself personally. The rejection of God comes from feeling like, well, <laughs> if there's a God, it must be evil because look at the world, essentially. Yeah. Um, well, thank you for answering that. And um, I won't keep you too much longer. Uh, do you have time for after I stop the recording, like five minutes? Sure. sure. All right, cool. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, this is Sticks, Hex, and Hammer 666, and he does not worship Satan. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> But he is a former Satanist, which Satanism is more on liberty? Pro-liberty. Pro -liber pro uh, I was an atheistic Satanist. I've never believed in the devil. All right. Well, there you have it. So common misconception, wipe away right there. All right.